morning, everyone. Good morning, guys. <laughs> Got folks in the uh, center. And uh, 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 good morning to those of you uh, online. Uh, fifth session today. And um, it, you'll see the natural progression of what we're trying to do. We'll, um, we are going to uh, talk about promoting your enterprise and making sure that uh, we find a way to attract those customers that we've talked about the uh, past few weeks uh, to target. The most important element, um, uh, I always tell the story of um, when I often do smart up, startup enterprise, uh, startup uh, uh, seminars, um, I'll ask people how they're going to get customers to come to them. And uh, any number of individuals will say, well, we're going to hope for referrals. And somebody in the audience will say, and referrals are the best types of um, customers, which of course is true. The trouble is when you are in startup mode, you have no base of customers to give you referrals. So it necessitates a promotional and marketing campaign in order to be able to drive uh, customers to your business or your enterprise, uh, either directly to stores through social media or whatever other business model you are using uh, to make money. So keep that in mind. This is a place where typically um, entrepreneurs and startups can fail. Um, there's all sorts of uh, activity out there uh, about why small businesses fail. Uh, the top one is usually access to capital or a, a failure to manage the business property. I'm actually a proponent of the later and the thing they fail to manage is their sales and marketing plan so they can drive enough customers uh, in order to make their um, enterprise or their small business uh, commercially viable. So with that, um, We'll get started. Um, a little housekeeping uh, just for the folks in the center who um, actually have helped me with this great deal and for those of you uh, who have sent emails on site. Um, over the next few weeks, we have a couple of things where uh, Bill Holleran will simply be sitting on the side and asking questions. Um, lots of uh, knowledge uh, needed on website, e-commerce, and digital marketing. I want to make sure all of you uh, get access to a content expert. So um, I've contracted with Cameron Nelson uh, out of uh, the University of Virginia. Uh, he does some work with our Central Virginia SBDC. He is going to uh, be here on August 15th and then again on August 29th. Um, on the 15th, he's going to spend some time on websites. Um, and uh, But on August 29th, he's also going to leverage that into e-commerce and digital marketing. Uh, for those of you online and in the center, uh, please keep my email and send me questions between now and then that you want to make sure he's entered. He has a basic uh, infrastructure pitch on how to do this from a uh, startup mode. Uh, can certainly be helpful to those of you who are in a high tech mode, uh, given his background. He has spent a little time in Silicon Valley. And um, uh, but uh, if you all would send me questions or things you want to make sure he covers or just questions you want answered ahead of time, I'll make sure those get to him um, and they get asked uh, during those um, uh, during those efforts. Uh, on September 7th, I'm going to have an entrepreneurial uh, uh, panel. We've had uh, three to seven people in the center here. Uh, during this effort, for any of you that are online and you're thinking that you might want to come by the Innovation Center, this would be a good day. We're going to have four entrepreneurs here, two part-time and two full-time. Um, there'll be some networking afterwards and all of that sort of stuff, but um, we always have some folks here. But for those of you online and you were thinking, I might want to uh, get by the center um, the uh, September 7th would be a good day. Um, I was just talking with Tiffany on how we will lay out the center that day, but keep that in mind. There will actually be some business owners here and um, you'll be able to ask them questions and uh, we'll have some Q&A with that. Um, I'm still fighting with vacations with our uh, my legal and accounting. I have plenty of these folks, um, but uh, I'll make sure I get you a legal and accounting session uh, before it's all done too. And all of that will be done with me emceeing it as opposed to uh, doing the uh, teaching. So just get these, wanted to get these dates on your calendar so that uh, you were um, uh, you were aware of them. The um, 
Today, we talk about building out promotional activities. So you can see the natural progression of the first four, four weeks. Uh, we are in, we've talked about access to capital, but then markets are the access to customers. We've talked about how to think through and define your products and services. Uh, always, we keep our first year projection nearby because as we encounter cost and things we need to be spend money on, we wanna make sure that that goes into our budget so nothing surprises us uh, financially. Uh, last week, we talked about how to begin targeting your list of target customers. And uh, today we're going to talk about all of the various options about uh, building out your promotional and your marketing plan to be able to uh, get, them, um, uh, get them to you. So, this is where we're at today. We're going to talk about assessing competition and then marketing sales and promotional strategies. So you can see once again, the natural progression from products and services, researching your market, targeting it down to your individual customers. Now we're going to get the lay of the land in terms of competitive elements. And then we are going to want to make sure that um, you lay out a marketing and sales and promotional strategy to do that. Next week, we'll finish this before we get into the special sessions with a uh, session on pricing strategy and all of those, and uh, we will uh, be through markets uh, pretty thoroughly. So um, we're here, of course, after products and services. We've talked about um, making money, making yourself useful to others, and always asking yourself your business model, how you will make money at it. Your brand, of course, is that promise to the customer of experience every time they touch your firm. And we want all of you seeking a competitive advantage that offers some differentiation in a commercially viable market. So we've been through uh, those elements. I'm sure all of you are still, some of you in startup mode are still thinking through what those products and services are. But remember, we have to start with that and um, because you have to have obviously something to sell. Competition. Um, always, um, uh, it's worth giving a thought to the competitors uh, that you face out there in the market. Remember, regardless of how good you are or how differentiated or how well you may think that your offering will be, the current folks in the market have an advantage you don't have, and that is that they are there, okay? They are there, they have a customer base, and they are living each and every day trying to make their businesses commercially viable or even um, uh, better. So the importance, as we talked about, of differentiation comes into play here. But in the end, competition for customers uh, is a uh, zero-sum game. The, uh, you have to look at who your competitors are, Okay, whether they are direct competitors or indirect competitors. I often tell folks who are thinking of restaurants, uh, you may have a completely different cuisine that no one has ever seen before, but the bottom line is all customers have the options of all restaurants, so you even have indirect uh, competition. Some people even look at restaurants uh, from a customer experience standpoint of being entertainment, so you compete against all of the things that people can do with their uh, free time and with their um, expendable income. There is nothing wrong and nothing illegal about um, finding out about your customers, okay? The, um, there are some things you can't do that are illegal. You can't spy on them uh, using um, uh, electronic means and things like that. But um, while you are new in a startup, you, it is the time you are least of the threat. And I'm going to tell you that all of you that get or start on a pace to become a commercially viable market, you can bet the best folks in your field are watching you. OK, so it is one thing to talk to lots of small businesses who may not think assessing the competition is important, but the best firms do this all of the time. OK, and remember, the best firms usually have most of the market share and most of the customers. So they are the folks to uh, emulate. Um, obviously, you can see uh, the spy games you can uh, get on websites. It's amazing what you can find on uh, Google and just sitting through there. Um, I've seen contractors and folks who sell business to businesses actually sit in um, adjacent parking lots of their customers and count trucks going in and out, knowing that trucks carried a certain load of whatever they were selling. Uh, just amazing um, how uh, innovative people can be there. Um, you can use secret shoppers. 
And um, always, always a best practice is to train yourself and your employees to gather competitive information. Um, the two things I always did when I was um, in business, and I still am in business, although I'm more an investor now than a day-to-day -day element, but when I was day-to-day -day involved in a business, for me, I always wanted to know who the really talented people were with my competitors because they became potential hires um, if I got good enough. And I always wanted to have an understanding of what they were charging to their uh, for their prices, because then I could make sure that I stayed in the competitive range uh, in terms of the market. If you do those two things and nothing else, um, you will um, you will go a long ways in terms of competitive analysis and be able to uh, research uh, to uh, make use of it. Um, online research, of course, um, anything websites, social media reviews. You want to know what your customers are doing. Check the online job boards and things like that do Boolean searches. It's amazing what comes out. You might find out that they've taken on a growth path around a new product because they're hiring a new specialized employee. And these are things that can be done quickly. You can set aside a portion of your week, usually about an hour to be able to do this and to keep track of them and uh, proceed accordingly. So knowing your competition is very important. There may be a few of you on, on, uh, online that say, I don't really have any competition. And my answer to that is that's not true, okay? There's always competition because the money that you want them to spend with you as a customer is being spent somewhere else. It may be indirect, okay? But you have to have a differentiated idea to uh, be able to uh, search that. So uh, just keep in mind being able to assess the competition. Those of you online looking at technology products or high tech, and are going to be pitching investors, you can bet this will be a question that any private investor that's considering giving you money will ask. They will want to know that you have assessed the competitive landscape and what you're up against uh, so they can assess your potential uh, for success. This is a competitive land and this disappeared on us, huh? So we can't figure that out? No, there we go. All of that at once. So. This is a competitive canvas. We do everything with canvas and maps these days. Uh, this is a real life example, small business uh, contractor uh, locally. And um, he sat down with me um, about a year ago and we put together a competitive canvas. Uh, this has two elements to it. One is his direct day-to-day -day competitors. And you can see those in the circles that surround it. He actually had seven. Uh, some of them were quite large. Some of them were equal to him, but he was always assessing where they wanted uh, to be able uh, to uh, play and what they were up to. Those were his direct competitors and worth him keeping a high, uh, keeping his eye on. He always kept aware of their top project managers because he thought that if he started to grow, this would be the first place he would go uh, looking for talent. The red areas outside that you see there are um, some elements that you need to keep in the back of your head as you do a competitive analysis. One, you'll see down there in the bottom right-hand corner is the power of new entrants. Many of you in this seminar are potential startups and the best businesses in the area that you are going are always on the lookout for the good new entrants. And you too, once you enter the business, will have to take into account that a startup may show up and uh, assess how they're going to compete about you. It is also worth knowing up there in the top uh, right-hand element, the power of the suppliers. If you're buying materials and things like that, um, the power of the suppliers um, and their ability to dictate terms to you may impact your business. Generally, that's not negative because they're doing, but often suppliers can have very stringent terms. Um, uh, this particular client has uh, customers that are well-paying customers of electric utilities, very large businesses, but they are always trying to dictate 30 to 60 day terms. So he has to wait 30 to 60 days to get paid for his money. He knows uh, that they have that kind of power. And so he has put a line of credit in place to help him with that. But uh, that's just an example of making sure that you understand the power of your suppliers and the terms that they can dictate. A best practice for those of you that have a supplier base is always have to 
two or three suppliers uh, that can give you what you need for your customer experience so that you can draw on them in times when they get overly busy or uh, you can make them compete against each other as well. Uh, there is always the power of substitute products. This is when someone comes up with a new idea. So you, uh, that's the re reason, frankly, I think you do online searches and uh, things like that. Keep in mind in any of your businesses, if someone comes up with a unique idea and things like that, it might be something you might want to copy. Generally, there's a rule of thumb in the academic literature on entrepreneurship that says if you have a brand new idea, you get about three to six months before the real good competitors catch up with you. So uh, there's the first mover advantage, but it eventually goes away. So um, just keep your eyes open for that. People are always trying to make incremental improvements on their products and so should you. And then of course, there's the power of the customers. Um, customers, uh, there's a great um, strategy activity uh, that someone put me through about uh, uh, eight years ago where they started with if you're gonna start your business and you have a customer and you know they will only pay this much money for your service, build your business model around that at the start and then build out your supply chain so that you can make money at it. Um, not all customers are that powerful, okay? But uh, some are, uh, but in the end, customers will pay generally within a competitive range and you need to be aware of that to be able uh, to do that. So just, this is a good competitive canvas and just a good way for you to go about staying aware of your competition. Always be aware of the major direct competitors and then these other four elements, new entrants, new products, the power of the suppliers and what the customers are thinking as a general review of the competitive canvas because all of your competitors are having to respond to those other four elements as well. This, I always liked this chart when I was taught it because this was something I could carry in my head. I could think about it. Um, I have nothing against writing it down and building databases of competitors and things like that, but I can always be aware of this and, um, uh, and um, do that. I do like to draw org charts of my uh, competitors, uh, management teams and things like that. But um, this is just a good way of thinking direct competitors. And then keep in mind these four outlying uh, elements. By the way, the four red elements are from a Harvard study done by a guy who's a master of strategy named Michael Porter uh, 25 or 30 years ago. These four elements have been uh, been around for uh, for some time. So we're not inventing rocket science there. Any other questions, okay, that you can walk through, particularly for those of you in startups. Uh, these next few slides are just a good uh, rendition of various uh, questions that you can ask. Who are the competitors in this business? Large, small, and keep your eye, eye, uh, eyes on the folks who are coming in just as you may be. Um, I always put down here, this is actually a term from a guy who ran General Electric named, uh, jo uh, uh, named George Welch assume they are damn good, okay? And what I really want you to assume and remember is the majority of your competitors may not be as good as you, but one, two, and three, the top two or three folks that you have the most respect for that you are running into on a continual basis, they are pretty good. And those are the ones that probably get the majority of the business. So keep your eyes on them and figure out how to differentiate uh, that. I always wanted to think that they were moving faster. I was always happy when I figured that I was ahead of them, but I knew I wasn't gonna be able to maintain that for uh, very long. It's good for you to know who the best are, one, two, or three. If you get into a business where you can measure market share, some of you with high growth prospects will be talked to this way, then you can certainly do that. And then you can search, search for niches uh, within that. That's in that SAM, SOM, uh, element that we talked about um, last week, and I'll have that up here. And then their characteristics. Um, if you're one of those individuals that needs a visual, um, a strength, weakness, opportunity, uh, threat, or a SWOT analysis is a standard, <coughs> long-standing uh, technique to evaluate every competitor where you can sort of sit down and just make a list of what's good, bad, and indifferent uh, about them. Um, I always want to know who my uh, competitor's main customers are. Um, I obviously hope I know how they buy, and uh, obviously I'm going to try and compete 
for that business on an ongoing business within the competitive range. I always want to know who their management team is uh, because those are folks that are potential hires for me in the future if I start to grow. And um, knowing the management team obviously is, um, is just helpful so you know who you are uh, competing against. Um, Ask yourself what they've been up to. Um, I know we've got some existing businesses now after talking with uh, a number of you over the past uh, uh, four weeks. Uh, so for the existing businesses, uh, it's worth looking at the competitors and find out what they have been up to in the past year. So you can do your research in that regard. Um, you're looking for new technologies, new products, um, some new distribution channels, some nuance to their business. Uh, that's going there, and then keep your eyes open for any new intra entrance. Many of you in this course will be in that realm, uh, so make sure that you're always looking over your shoulder to see if somebody else is thinking of starting up in your element. And then assess yourself. What have you done in the past year to change the competitive playing field and give you a differentiation? Here are a few examples. You could have introduced a new product, you could have stolen a key competitor's key salesperson, you could have licensed a new technology, you could have developed a nuance to your product. Um, and then be truthful with yourself and make sure that you analyze whether or not you lost any competitive advantages. Someone took a salesperson from you um, or is developing a uh, new proprietary technology. So what have they been up to? And then what you have been up to? And for those of that you are a startup, as soon as you start day one, you wanna be asking your question, that question all the time. Once you do those three things, you can plot your winning move. Okay, so a new product, a partnership, a critical employee, uh, any number of ways uh, that your creativity takes you. Just make sure you're figuring out a way to make money at it, to attract customers, and that it's large enough to be commercially viable for those of you that are interested in full-time and high-growth uh, startups. Um, and you can see here the best product products for sustainable advantage. You always can get incremental improvements. You can see there the academic research I talked about earlier that says um, it takes three to six months for someone to learn and imitate, even if they're watching at this level of activity. Uh, so you have that much of an advantage uh, to gain with customers, exploit it, and uh, then things tend to fall back into the competitive uh, uh, range. Always continuous improvement, imitate, improve, always search for a better way for improving your customer experience and the competitive analysis uh, will keep you in good mode. That done now. So remember, we've done the marketing research. The, we have walked through your overall market. We've started to target your market and we've done an assessment for those of you starting up of what the competition is doing. With all of those in hand, you are ready to determine what will be your best marketing sales and promotional activities. And, um, and then next week, we'll talk about um, all of the activities you can do for pricing. So you can see the logical step for that. And then when we get to marketing sales and promotional activities, obviously, there are lots of, um, lots of um, opportunities. Let me stop there. Any questions or anything? Nope. Good. So the, um, we have someone in the waiting room. So um, designing your campaign, okay? Now keep in mind when we design a campaign, I want you to have all the understandings and all the targeting information at your element. But as you make decisions, you are making decisions that probably uh, have spending elements to them. Uh, I want them built into that first year budget into your marketing and uh, promotional elements. So of course you design the campaign, you've done this. You've understood the problem, the need, the want of the customer. You're adapting your products and services to that particular need. And you are searching for those of you with full-time and high growth aspirations for a commercially viable market that you can grow into and make money at uh, for both yourself, for your customers and for the folks that work for you. Hone the list or your demographic profile. Okay, if you're selling business to business, business or you're selling to government, okay, we want a list. I want a substantial list, okay, because once we have the list, we can start putting people where, when, and how, and you can start determining how you're going to approach to them and, uh, and do your direct sell elements. For those of you that are online, 
or, uh, or operating a retail store. We want your demographic profile and list uh, in place. We wanna make sure that that demographic profile has been overlaid a location and that you find a location that then you can market out within a geographic sphere to attract those customers to your store. Or in the case of those that you that operate only online, you can attract that demographic profile from a very broad uh, element online uh, to get them to come to your website and, um, and to uh, purchase for there. Then we craft our message and we craft the campaign. Always remember the market segmentation element, okay? There are three types of customers, consumers, businesses, and government. Businesses and government will require you to sell uh, space to face. Consumers usually get into personas. Tiffany and I were talking about that earlier this morning. Uh, for those of you online, uh, target profiles and demographic profiles make sense. If you have a tough time with that, you might do personas or things like that of the type of people that buy for you. And then of course, we will design the campaign to attract those individuals. Businesses and governments are segments that can be broken down to RFPs, the companies, the decision makers that you need to talk to, their title and function. And then you're going to probably have to put a direct sales uh, program in place to uh, if that is your target market. Always know your customer behavior and you wanna build your experience about this. Who are they? What are they buying? What are they buying now? Um, what are the decision criteria that they use to do this? This is a good eight question element, uh, particularly for those of you selling business to business that you can walk through it. It helps you size up uh, the current state of that customer. You may identify a very broad list of customers and you may find that when you go out there, some of them are in buying mode as we speak. They're doing their budgets. Some of them will say, come back and see us in two or three months. You'll want a tickler system that does that, but always be asking these questions because the customer behavior is ongoing throughout an annual period. And you'll see here in a minute, uh, that's why I tell people, I think you need to think through your marketing and sales effort on an annual basis uh, giving that all customers won't be available on day one, but they may be available uh, during a uh, annual uh, cycle. The um, assess your benefits, how do they benefit? And um, more and more, um, uh, I always like to concentrate on these important things. Uh, the, uh, I can help a customer if I can help them make money, I can help them save money, or if they've got a real, real problem. Okay, but more and more uh, talking with folks like Tiffany and many of you, um, it is worth assessing the emotional state of that customer. Uh, you'll hear people talk about their pain and all of that sort of stuff. And if you can get to that and you have a customer experience that solves that, you are really building a very, very strong uh, relationship. So I'm a big fan of the traditional benefits and things like that. Um, and um, for many years, I didn't give much countenance to emotions. I was wrong about that. Uh, so getting to know your customers, even at that level, uh, will, uh, enhance your, um, will enhance your ability to, uh, to be able to sell to them. So then we returned to last week, and you can see where we are now. We've come from an overall market assessment that you've done to targeting, and we are talking now about your ability to reach that SOM or that obtainable market. So hopefully you can see how all of this begins to add together. In the end, you need a demographic profile or a goal or a list um, to be able to move out and move forward. Very, very important that you do this you know, for those of you online that are considering a high growth startup. And for those of you online who are considering a startup that you want to turn into a full-time venture. You can be a little bit more particular um, and have a much smaller list if you're a part-time business, as long as you can get to them and you can meet your financial goals. But uh, predominantly, um, I want to make sure that we take care of our startups and our high growth elements because you need a commercially viable market that is higher than the uh, part-time elements. Then you can say, what an annual sales and marketing plan. So when you're doing your business planning or whatever you want to call it, it is worth just like your budget that you look out over a 12 month period. I often say to startups, I want you to know what you're going to do the first day you open the door to attract customers. And then that will become a moving target. 
but um, I want you to know that obtainable market. I want you to have that list or that demographic profile. And then I want you to know what you're going to do to start finding customers, customers and driving them to their floor, uh, to your store or offering them your online services or selling them a uh, business to business. Initially, once you know that um, obtainable market, uh, there's a great place to focus. So as you're looking at your list, consider those uh, that you start to talk to where the need or the pain is most acute. Um, these are the folks you send that first letter to, or you send that first email to, or you have that first conversation over the phone and they say, I've been looking for someone like you. I need you in here right away. Okay, that's a good indication that somebody has an acute need uh, that is going unfulfilled. That is generally the area of the lowest competitive pressure uh, that you will feel. You will still feel competitive pressure, um, and particularly for if larger businesses or if um, government organizations are part of your target market, they will make sure that they make the end users of the technical folks think of other competitors. Procurement folks almost always wanna make sure that there are two or three people competing for business. And then I want you to choose the easiest access that you can get to them. But my experience is that you will have to spend some money on marketing and promotional activity to do. Have these in place and then execute and then budget, okay? And then for sales and marketing and attracting customers, Actually, for the first two or three months, you may be having this conversation with you yourself on a daily basis. Most businesses then ratchet this down to a very, very important weekly meeting where they discuss who their new businesses are, who their current businesses are, what they are going to do for them. And then they make adjustments and they talk about that and then they move out and they execute during the course of the week. So that's how an annual sales and marketing plan is generally put in place for a high growth or a, um, or a full scale uh, startup. And then you can see, we come back to uh, start enterprises. In this case, you can see over the past couple of weeks, we've identified any number, okay, of line items. And now you can see why we made a line item for marketing and promotion, because you are likely going to have to spend some money developing websites, advertising, uh, email commerce, or things like that, that uh, needs to be budgeted for, and you need to think about how much it's going to cost you over the entire year. And then for those of you selling business to business or to government activities, uh, obviously when you start out, you may be the chief sales and marketing offer, officer, but often firms that start to grow substantially will hire an individual to oversee the sales and or marketing process so while you're not spending money perhaps on a uh, paid magazine uh, element or an online Google search, you are spending money to hire somebody uh, that has to go out there and sell what you have to offer. Keep in mind, if your business is outside the geographical area, you will need to add travel expenses, which can become quite substantial um, if your business will take you to a customer base that is outside your geographical area. So this, I just want to tell you, is what I mean by budgeting and thinking through over the year what your marketing and sales efforts are and what they're going to cost. I almost always talked about wages, how much the individual was going to have to travel. And once I put somebody traveling, depending upon the distance, I was either paying mileage, I was paying airfare, I was certainly paying hotel, I was going to have to cover them and let them eat. And I generally was going to have them uh, doing some entertaining for uh, at least our existing customer base and things like that. So I have lunches and dinners to pay for. And believe me, you will want to budget that and make sure that uh, you have that in working order and understood uh, what's available to your um, to the individuals that you hire to help you with that. So all that in place, let's talk about all your options, okay? that um, are available uh, for you to put a, a marketing or sales campaign in place. So first you need a message. Okay, we talked about the benefits and don't leave out the emotions. Obviously that is a very good way uh, to do that. And I'm sure you, many of you have heard 
uh, when you talk to people about getting a customer's attention, you don't have very much time. I actually think you have considerably more time than a few seconds, unless you're doing everything online and everything is meant catching them. But when you're talking business to business or government to government, people will listen. They're listening for what they need, not what you need. Okay. But nevertheless, um, it is worth making sure that you craft a nice marketing message uh, that gets what you have to sell and your business model into their head very, very quickly. If you're online, um, there is lots of data out there about grabbing their attention in a few sections and moving to a call to action, as you'll see in that. But not all business is done online. So uh, just make sure that um, you are being succinct and you're aware that you are touching the things that you know that they want to uh, hear. Generally, uh, pitches fit like this. Um, you can see here. Um, I always like this, uh, the date on email, five word subject, and you can actually write a couple of paragraphs. Uh, there's real good data out there suggesting at least if you've targeted your customers correctly, okay, that uh, people will read that if they believe they have some interest in what you're selling. Keep in mind when you hear the folks telling you, you only have seven seconds to get someone's attention, that may be that you have not targeted your market precise enough OK, and that they just click away because they don't um, have any interest in what you might be selling. Um, your voicemail needs to be 15 to 20 seconds. It is worth you developing and refining an elevator pitch. So that if somebody asks what you're doing, you can deliver that in 20 to 30 seconds um, along with a uh, business card or some other way for them uh, to uh, remember. If you actually sell through networking events, uh, trade shows and things like that, um, a two-minute pitch is acceptable because generally when you're in those venues, particularly if you're trade shows, you're going to trade shows in the industry that you exist in. If uh, people are at networking events, they're looking to meet other individuals and finding out what they um, have to uh, sell. It's worth, you see there down there, that prepare, rehearse. Um, I'm a big fan of recording yourself. OK, and then you can adapt it as you change things or things like that. But uh, just know that uh, you've got these things in order. Virtually every business, part time, full time or high growth startup will need these elements and will use them over and over again. Make sure they put your best foot forward and uh, gather attention. And remember, we're trying to do that to be polite but we also want this at your target market. So um, if you do these kinds of things, you'll be able to assess people who approach you um, against your target market, um, as well as uh, making sure that you're giving a concise um, uh, pitch whenever uh, you're asked by individuals that may be your target market. Always, and particularly for those of you online, uh, the um, data, that is calling out is a call to action has become the term, okay? What that means is everything gets somebody moving towards purchasing your product and service. So uh, it's not just talking about what you have to offer, but what is the next step for getting them involved with you? For those of you selling to government and business to business, that may be a phone call and appointment so that you can go in for formal presentations. For those of you selling online to individual consumers, this may be a very, very quick um, call to action that gets them into how they purchase your product um, or how they can at least give you contact information that you can remarket to on an ongoing business, uh, on an ongoing basis. So voice and text do this. Obviously, any number of the uh, social media elements do it, email all of those sorts of things. And for those of you who have part of your marketing strategy to enhance your website or developing apps, uh, it's absolutely essential. An app, you want to call to a cash and hey, you can buy right now, okay, um, is uh, what you want to put in place. So just think through all of this activity, but always the end game after you explain and educate. And remember, you don't have all the time in the world to be able to do that. You want to put a call to action in place, and that will start to give you some idea as to whether or not your uh, campaign is working on a uh, consistent basis. 
You need outbound marketing efforts. The slide after this is about inbound marketing efforts. Um, I, uh, I believe the reason most small businesses fail is a poor marketing and sales strategy. And the reason is, is many small business owners starting up try to bootstrap this expense. And that's a mistake for those of you that are startups because you don't have a base of customers to grow on. As you said, what I told you earlier, I've heard more people say, I'm going to wait for referrals and come to me. You have no base of customers to give you referrals, okay? And so it is a poor activity uh, for a, um, uh, for a uh, startup. You must even spend money in social media, okay? If you want to attract people to your website, against all the websites out there using Boolean searches and keywords and all of that, you're going to have to spend a little bit of money on websites and making sure that you're tracking that people um, are uh, finding their way to you. So I want an assertive and a proactive campaign that you're probably going to have to budget and spend some money on, okay? Um, we can advertise, we can email, we can do mailers, we can do uh, canvassing. I'll give you examples of those in all of this. Never leave out signage for those of you who actually open up a place, okay? It's amazing how important that can be. And um, generally solid marketing is done short term. A program is put in place, it is repeated, okay? And then it is assessed, okay? And then you come back, you take what worked, and you may get a little creative with something else, and then you uh, spend the money on what didn't work um, somewhere else. Um, it's almost a joke, although it turns out to be proved. Many, many years ago, I was taught by advertising and, uh, and public relation professionals you have to do this type of assertive marking. And I would love to tell you that the world can be very predictive about what will work, but it won't. And the joke the advertising folks always told me was, whenever you start down this path, 50% of what you try to do will work and 50% will not. And the trouble is, is you won't know it until you spend the money and enter the market. So once again, you can see the importance of the assertive approach. You can see the importance of budgeting. You can see the importance of the constant weekly assessment. So you can say what worked and what did. You will be amazed in your first three to six months how you will do some things that really start to work. And the slightest tweaks can change the difference between finding five people and finding 20. But you will only do that if you're turning over your business every single uh, uh, day. Often marketing expenses of this tenor can run in and may be one of your largest expenses uh, going out. So that's the reason to do the budget so that we uh, make sure we know what it's going to cost you and you can work um, accordingly. As opposed to inbound marketing, which is passive. Now, online and all of that can get pretty interesting. Uh, okay, this day, particularly if you get a website. But my experience is if you spend money on a significant website that's getting consistent contact and can be analyzed with SEO and other activities um, that Google and any of the folks can show you, um, this is an approach that will still cost you money. And for those of you starting up and trying to get to commercial viability, it's just a real issue waiting and hoping customers come to you. You have to do something of an outbound nature to do that. And I just want you prepared to all of the folks who say, well, I didn't really spend anything. If they didn't really spend anything. I bet that top sales line item is not uh, very large there. So make sure that you're thinking in an assertive approach um, and uh, proceeding from there. And I just don't want you generally to make the mistake of thinking that you can create a viable commercial business without an effective marketing and sales strategy that you have to spend a little bit of money on uh, in order uh, to, uh, to make that work. Then of course, uh, online. Uh, online you know, has displaced a great deal of the uh, printing industry. Um, you should at a minimal, at a minimum have a Google business profile. Uh, for those of you considering part-time businesses, send me an email. Um, Google does a nice little 30-minute presentation on the very basics that will make sure you show up 
if someone comes looking for your individual business. It will not allow you to compete against other websites very well, but it will tell people that you are on the web. It will give name, address, telephone number, and four elements, and they essentially allow you to put this in place uh, for free. That's for the part-time businesses. I don't have too much trouble for that for full-time businesses, as long as the web is not very important to you. I'm just becoming, it's becoming very hard for me to believe in this day and time that the web is not significant. Uh, lots of people, even if they become aware of you, will come searching for you on the web. And so you need some sort of legitimate uh, website um, element. Then of course, online is very big. Um, uh, stories, tutorials, you see them here. Uh, video versus just having a static website uh, has become the norm. Uh, and then some of you can engage online activities in their full throttle using ads, using blogs, using podcasts, all of those sort of things. And then for those of you that are selling business to business and are selling to uh, government sites, LinkedIn uh, is actually just an absolute necessity, I think, if you want to garner additional customers, because after websites, LinkedIn is the next place 80% of the time people will go looking uh, to uh, find out your business and who you are, and they will be looking to assess you as well as the individual business. Stay on message. Uh, make sure that you refine your customer experience and you know what the benefits are that they are seeking. But um, online is the new, it's not a new area anymore. It's the area of greatest creativity. It's where the advertising world has gone to and uh, your ability to exploit this for your target markets uh, will make you um, that much more successful. So um, then all the things you can do. Obviously you can still use printed materials. Um, Coupons and sales promotions are still something that uh, businesses use over and over again. Um, I'm going to show you an example here of a part-time business that uh, used door hangers quite effectively uh, to get to where they wanted to be. Generally, my experience in this day and time, though, is that printed materials are best directed at your existing customer base. In other words, they've already bought from you. There's someone who has found your customer experience uh, important, and now you want them to come back and create recurring revenue. And these are ways uh, to be able to do that. Uh, Bed Bath & Beyond for years used that ubiquitous profile. I used to collect them in the mail for my wife. <clears throat> and uh, we would have 10 or 15 laying around the house until I would throw them away. But um, uh, my, my, my wife has done a fair amount of uh, shopping at Bed Bath & Beyond, and I've even been in it once or twice. Um, so all of these printed materials are that. Less and less for small businesses these days, the glossy ads and magazines and things like that. Um, there are just a lot of things that you can do that are much more targeted online than that. But uh, printed materials uh, still have uh, their place. Don't forget your business cards as well, okay? Um, postcards, things like that. This is just a standard graphical standard uh, layout of... Um, uh, what um, you can make postcards, brochures, and uh, business cards look at. I saw a client I am working with, <clears throat> actually he'll be here on uh, September 7th. Um, we were doing our debrief um, two weeks ago and he walked in and he had a business card with nothing on it. It was called IDOT, okay? And when you took the IDOT and you hit my phone, it told you everything about him and all the places to be able to find it. I can sell from the folks in the audience that some of you have discovered that very, very effective um, business card and kind of snazzy uh, when you uh, show it to the customer so that you're um, uh, doing things. So, um, and it gets all the data delivered very, very quickly. Okay. Um, but um, business cards and things like that still have their place uh, from time to time. When you advertise, <clears throat> this is standard methodology coming out of the advertising and public uh, relations things. When you're trying to budget, you want to know how much. When you try something, try it at least three times. That's sort of the minimal frequency. I actually used to hear that when we talked about newspaper ads and advertising on the radio and advertising on television. And obviously more frequency can do that, but that takes higher budgets. But for small businesses, you want to lay out plans that you can do two or three times you want to track them, and then you want to adjust to what works and what doesn't work. 
So a very straightforward repeat and track activity that is uh, that methodology is probably 60 years old, but it's at least um, it's at least 30 years old for the time that I have been exposed to this. This is whether you do it in traditional media, newspapers, radio, television, or if you do it online. Uh, give yourself a chance to make sure that you know whether or not it um, it works or not. And then once again, we plan, okay? So the first thing I want you to do is to lay out that annual budget with what you intend to do. Think of what you are going to do those first 30 days when you open your business on an ongoing basis uh, to be able to attract customers. And then, as I said, during those first 30 days, I can tell you, you may be having lots of conversations with yourself about what you want to do to attract customers. I hope you are, but after that, I want you to be able to have a regimented sales and marketing effort uh, that is being evaluated every week and then is being executed the day that you are not putting it in place. Um, all sorts of ways to do this, as you can see here, you can plan ahead, you can certainly research, you can look at your competitors and see what works for them, uh, but track your actions, measure the effectiveness, what works and what doesn't, adapt, and then just keep a marketing and sales effort in place throughout your first year to give you the uh, greatest uh, chance of uh, success. For those of you that have um, or have raised or saved enough money to start, you can actually go out and fire content experts and all of this. Um, if uh, you're so in line, uh, there is lots of help for free, small business development centers, innovation centers. Uh, there are lots of experts within those activities, depending upon what you're doing. Uh, you may find it. Tiffany and I were talking about an activity she had to do for some government groups a couple of weeks ago. Um, those of you selling to government, there is an organization called PTAC, for example, which can give you access to RFPs up the wazoo uh, if you are going after the um, government market. And then these are Hollerins and uh, the SBDP's <clears throat> best rules. So you can see just in order, okay, we want you to assess, okay, or aim, okay? Don't shoot afterwards. So understand the behavior, focus on a niche, determine your differentiation and the value you bring to the customer, know the recipient of your message, okay? And then craft the message with both benefits and emotions. Then make your decision as we walk through on your best media, make sure it is concise, make sure you're doing it on a consistent basis and evaluating it over the course of the first year, adjust and use your dollars appropriately. And then when something works, do it over and over and over again until it stops. And then make sure the customer experience that you developed is in ready for the customers that arrive. Okay, the worst thing in the world would be to have your promotional strategy work and then they come in and they have a bad experience and they don't come back. Okay, the best business model I have ever seen for a startup for any business is I want a marketing and sales plan that attracts new customers on a regular basis. And I want to be talking about recurring customers coming back to me on an ongoing basis. Those two things give you two tracks to make money and are very, very effective. I realize there's some of you that may have some one-time sales, and I certainly understand that, but many, many businesses can figure out a way to have those two tracks, and it's a very, very effective uh, business model if you can come up with that. So a couple of examples. Here's a full-time startup. Um, in this case, um, the, uh, this was home-based. So this individual makes $55,000 a year clear, okay? Um, the, um, she, uh, she actually was a home-based childcare service. Nothing terribly fancy about that, but um, she did sit down with me a few years ago, put in place the customer experiences. We walked through a business plan. Uh, we did some nice basic graphical standards. She actually used just a basic Google website, um, but um, the, I, I'm sorry, wrong one, that's the next one. This was the retailer I talked about, the florist, in the first week. This is what she did. Um, she came up and made sure that her store had an excellent sign, okay, so that she was attracting always 
the uh, the traffic. She got her self on a road. Um, in this case, up in uh, in York County on the peninsula um, on Route 17. So she made sure her signage let everybody knew who drive by there that there was a florist there. Um, that was for impulse buys and just so that people who drove by every day do that. Remember, thousands of people might go by and glance at your sign. In her case, she had done a demographic profile for a geographic area. This was pre-internet, okay? And she paid for door hangers, okay? And had them distributed in her geographical area at a rate that she could afford. Uh, she laid out a three month campaign, canvassed her area, and then did the same thing to the same areas uh, over the next three months. Obviously that required her to build a budget uh, to put that in place, to get the printing done and to have the hangers uh, put out there. Anybody who came in her store got a magnetic business card to put on their refrigerator, okay? Because she was a florist, she wanted them thinking and knowing that they could go right to their refrigerator and call or get online. Um, she budgeted this consistently. She had a personal goal of uh, giving out 500 within this uh, one to three month um, uh, element. As you recall, she did a customer card on everyone who walked in her store. So when she came in, she would talk to you about the product. She would get your name. She would get your telephone number. When the online element, the internet, she would get up your email if you would offer it to her. And then at the end of the day, she had a nice little pile and she would go back and she would enter them into a database. And then on the following Monday, she would go back and look for those customers and tell them what she had to offer. What she got so exceptional at over the year that I watched is her interview, okay, of a customer while she was selling in the store would start to uh, would start to ask a woman, do you have kids? Do you have a husband? When is your anniversary? And however many, much information she could get, she would get back and put into this database so she could market anniversaries, birthdays. And she became, she developed an ability to do this on a very personalized basis. She eventually did build a website and a social media campaign um, as the internet emerged in, uh, in the 2000s. Um, what I like so much about her is uh, she's successful to this day. And the, um, the interesting thing is when we talk about recurring customers, this database has become so important to her that she almost doesn't do anything for new customers any day anymore. She comes in for her current customer base, markets to them. And when she needs a new customer base, she asks that current customer base for referrals. So uh, just very nicely done. This is the example um, of the individual uh, that I think I've uh, told you about. This was such a nifty business model. And of course you can probably all ascertain from someone who's growth oriented like me, I went and uh, told her in about her second or third year, we should just duplicate this and do another store. And she looked at me and said, nope, I'm good. Okay, so remember her call, her passion in life was designing floral arrangements or coming up with those kinds of things for individuals. That's what she wanted to do. And once she had her business to a commercially viable state, she was completely happy doing that. She had to keep her eyes on competitors. Okay, there have been people trying to aggrandize this market for years uh, without too much uh, success, but um, just an excellent, well thought out marketing campaign that you can see is relatively simple, okay? There's no real um, uh, rocket science here other than the persistence to keep developing that recurring uh, customer base. Full time, and this was her. So you remember her from the uh, last time and this is her sales sequence to revenue and then recurring revenue. So, this, is, uh, this was the full-time childcare startup. I'm sorry, I put it in second. Define the customer experiences. Many of you probably just know tangentially, uh, even if you're a home-based childcare service, you, um, there are very strong regulatory requirements that have to be put in place for occupancy. Over time, she started 
being um, uh, with the ability to take care of four children. She eventually grew it to 10. I think that's about the maximum you can have for a home-based child care service. It may not be the maximum, but you, uh, really, um, you really are starting to turn your house into a full-scale child care center and not just the front of the floor. Um, first floor was impeccable on the first card and she had business cards. This is what she did. And remember, this was the advantage here and so I'm sure many of you online and me, we've all paid, we know how much we pay for childcare. So she knew that if she could have four full-time individuals 52 weeks a year, that she could have a viable business that met her personal financial goals. In her case, what she did is she developed a high glass, high gloss, two-sided pamphlet. It was a door hanger, okay? Uh, it had a picture of the inside. On one side, it had her contact information and the ages that she would handle. She literally, when she started her business, took 10 of these, walked outside of her home, went to the five houses next to her and the five hours, houses in the other directions and hung the door hangers, okay? And she did that for the next 20 days, okay? Until she filled her initial um, goal of four individuals. So that's all she did in order to garner those uh, new customers. She did walk down to the local school and let them know that she was in there. She gave business cards, uh, and I think she still does this to everybody she uh, met. She started with a very small website, but she has spent some money on an interactive website. Frankly, that's more. So uh, there's some very good child care websites where the parents can tune in on a daily basis to see what's going on, even though they're at work. And uh, she has spent the money on that uh, in her home. Uh, she, the first floor is almost totally for her child care business and her and her husband and her one child uh, live on the second floor. And that was the reason she was home based. So you can see this is a, she makes in excess of $50,000 a year profit. Okay. Because she keeps her enrollment up. She has grown it to 10. And you can see this was a very, very straightforward uh, marketing effort. And uh, she just repeats it whenever children outgrow the age groups, um, and she does it within her um, within her um, neighborhood. And then um, a good part-time one uh, client I worked with um, uh, about uh, three years ago was a DJ. Okay, um, the uh, wanted a part-time activity was a real jazz enthusiast. Uh, not my particular genre of music, but uh, that's what uh, she was very good at. And of course, to be a DJ, you've got to be able to do parties, hits, and all of that sort of thing. In her business planning, we laid out the available weekends and nights for an entire year where she could go do the work and get gigs. Um, I think that's the first I actually heard that word, uh, but she said it to me so much. Um, she did virtually everything with business, um, she adopted the IDOT uh, card and uh, she made a point to hand out 150 business cards um, each and every month. She did a small WordPress website that had constant social media updates and she sold directly within a limited sphere. She was over on the peninsula as well to the small pubs and to the clubs that used DJs from time to time throughout the year. Uh, those of you, um, the, I don't go to too many of these, but I did in my younger days. Generally, most folks did not want somebody to be there the entire year. They want a change of genre, a change of DJs, but she could get two or three weeks worth of work and then come back to them six months later and they would reset it and let it. Nice little part-time business. Uh, uh, she makes about uh, $22,000 a year, free and clear. Um, and she has a full-time job. And uh, her goal in life um, is to fill 50% of these available dates um, throughout, um, throughout the year. Uh, she actually gets about 60 or 70. Um, I haven't talked to her in three or four months, uh, but she, um, I often wonder when she sleeps, but um, you can see she is using that, uh, this part-time income in order to uh, build out her financial capabilities with emergency funds. She wants to take care of um, uh, putting money aside for um, 
uh, her youngster to be able to go to college and, uh, and to uh, uh, plan for retirement. So a nice little use of a part-time business and uh, something she really enjoys doing. Um, and um, uh, you can see, once again, a very thorough marketing plan thought out over the course of the year. Not a whole lot of money invested, some time invested, okay, to become aware of who all the clubs and uh, small pumps warrant to talk to the owner so that they would use her, but uh, a very effective uh, use of that. And then uh, for our high growth startups, this firm is in existence as we speak, about three years old. Uh, they have a high tech biological product, a very defined process for uh, come up, customer experience. And when we did their initial business plan, we determined that there was a nationwide and an international market. Their biological process, this is a guy who studied microbes for years and has figured out how to way to make them evaporate really nasty water out there that people want to go away. Uh, we walked through his intellectual property strategy, actually with a firm right down the street here that he eventually showed. And then he made his effort. He identified two target industries and sought out a client pilot project, which he has done. It's a very interactive website because his website needs to draw people in. So he is constantly doing things to draw them to it and taking care of the Boolean words. He's on LinkedIn. In his case, we did white papers and things like that because this is a, um, this is a process that uh, people need to read and understand. So when you hear everybody tell you, you've only got seven seconds to get people's attention, it's a high tech or a high need product that someone's looking for, they'll take the time to make sure you know what you're talking about. This is a direct sales effort. And right now he has been doing that for the past two years. He's getting very close to hiring a sales person on staff. He has used, as you can see down there at the bottom, independent manufacturing reps to cover the Western part of the United States, which is where there is a big group of his customers. Sales process is very straightforward. He has to educate the clients on what they do. He builds relationships. He often has to respond to RFPs and bids. And um, he has actually just in the past six months started to make his way with government contracts. So you can uh, see this has great potential. Okay, um, if, uh, if it turns out he's not there yet, uh, but if you saw his total addressable market and things like that, you would see things in the billions of dollars. And generally, this, this pilot project is any indication. People spend thousand dollar, thousands of dollars a month for his service. So there's real high growth potential here uh, if this process turns out to be better than the various competitive uh, ways that it's been done in the past. So uh, that's a real good example of a high growth startup and you can see all the things they had to do. And in his case, he sells business to business uh, from that end. So let's stop there and then we'll go.